Order. <coughs> if I could ask members to resume their seats, please, and if we could have some order. The uh, next item on the agenda is questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, Mr. John Blair. I am committed to maintaining and developing our public transport network. This is a key priority for me both in supporting sustainable modes of transport, which is underpinned by my department's significant capital investment in our public transport network, but also in contributing where I can to the health and prosperity of our community by encouraging modal shifts towards the widespread use of public transport by our citizens. With this in mind, I have engaged extensively over the last year with executive colleagues to address the future financial stability of our public transport network. I have taken action throughout my time as Minister to underline my commitment and have instructed my officials to explore ways to ensure that my department continues to meet its obligations to TransLink's financial viability under the current public service agreement. This work is ongoing and to date has resulted in over £100 million of COVID-19 mitigation funding being provided to support our public transport services and our essential workers throughout the pandemic. Our public transport and passenger numbers have been severely impacted by COVID-19. The recovery and resilience of our public transport network is a commitment we all must share as we move through and beyond COVID and tackle the climate crisis. I will continue to work with the Department for Finance and executive colleagues as 2021-22 unfolds. Mr. Blair. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister give us further information and reassurance around whether the additional funding, which is of course welcome, can be used as well as alleviating the current situation um, into the recovery plan for TransLink and its customers? I thank the member for his question, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, as a department, we have engaged with TransLink to review the impact of COVID-19, and we use this assessment to inform our projected requirements. In short, we have used the most up-to-date information available to underpin our projections. However, one lesson that COVID-19 has undoubtedly taught us all is that circumstances can change. While I have ensured that our public transport provider is currently in a stable position to meet the anticipated financial challenges of 2021-22, this is something that my department will keep under review and we will liaise with the Department of Finance throughout the next financial year to ensure our public transport services are adequately funded. To reassure the member, I take the challenge of recovery in our public transport uh, system very seriously uh, and have been engaging with colleagues right across these islands. Uh, this week I will be again engaging with my ministerial counterparts in Scotland and Wales so that we can put our heads together to ensure that we can see a resilient recovery for our public transport networks right across these islands. Mr Cathal Boylan. Um, I thank the Minister for her answers. But Minister, just for the future, uh, post-COVID, what steps can you take or TransLink take to ensure that they're on a solid footing? I know that they received money in the January monitoring round, and it's a vital public service. But in the future, what steps can you take to ensure this on a solid footing? I thank the member for raising a very uh, important uh, issue, uh, and TransLink is very much focused in the here and now, ensuring that we can provide a secure. Um, and safe uh, transport system for all of our citizens, regardless uh, of where they live. The member will be aware of the number of actions that TransLink has and continues to take um, in terms of deep cleansing of, of fleets, ensuring that we have additional capacity on standby to meet social distancing requirements. Uh, and as I said in my response to uh, Mr Blair, we are looking right across these islands, and I am looking across the world to learn best practice to ensure that whatever steps we can take, we do to increase passenger confidence to ensure that when we get to the right point, we can encourage people to again reuse or use their public transport. It is important uh, in terms of getting us through COVID, but it is also, as a member will appreciate, critical in terms of our climate emergency. Mrs Dolores Kelly. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. My, my particular concerns are around the regional imbalance and particularly rural transport. I had to uh, recently engage with TransLink to have uh, some bus services put on at a more appropriate time. So I just wonder, Minister, in terms of review uh, and, and the assurances that the Executive and yourself can give in relation to uh, rural transport provision in the future. 
I thank the member for her question. Um, as you are aware, TransLink delivers the majority of our public transport network, and this is supported by private transport providers who play an important role in improving our connectivity uh, throughout the north. Our public transport network is defined uh, in my department's public service agreement with TransLink, and my department has an obligation under that agreement to fund the delivery of these services. Given the level of support that I have secured and extensive engagement with my executive colleagues in support of that obligation, our public transport provider is in a stable position to deliver these services, which I can assure the member include a large number of rural services. As I have already outlined, I am committed to maintaining a public transport network that covers all of Northern Ireland, including our rural areas, for those who need it. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank the member for his question. On the 13th of November, following executive agreement, the Taxi Driver Financial Assistance Scheme was launched for two weeks, closing on the 27th of November. The scheme provides financial support for overheads incurred by taxi drivers and is in addition to other financial support provided, such as, uh, uh, such as through the Self-Employment Income uh, Support Scheme. Payments began issuing within one week of the scheme closing, and by the 15th of January, over 4,100 drivers had received the £1,500 grant, which equates to almost 90% of the valid applications received. Uh, rejection letters were issued to the remaining unsuccessful applicants on the same day. However, some of these applicants responded to the letter and have since provided the necessary information required to successfully process their applications to payment. Staff continue to work with a small number of applicants this week to successfully process their applications. To date, this exercise has increased the number of payments made to over 4,200 which means that over 92% of applicants have now received the 1500 payment. The remaining 370 applicants who were unsuccessful may be eligible for assistance under the next scheme, which is due to launch this month. Mr. Carroll. For her answer, uh, even though uh, some people had breaks in their insurance, they didn't cease to become taxi drivers and uh, many of them unable to work. Uh, does the Minister accept that it is unacceptable that many taxi drivers still, uh, are still without any payment? And what will she and her executive colleagues do to address this? And she mentioned obviously 90 per cent of applications uh, were valid and therefore received a payment, but what uh, percentage of that compares to taxi drivers who uh, didn't receive any payments uh, whatsoever? Thank you. I thank the member um, for his question. And the second scheme has reflected on the learning from the first scheme. Uh, so the second scheme will be based on the same principle and sector evidence base in terms of overheads as the first scheme. Uh, and that cost would still have to be incurred by the driver, thereby continuing to ensure value for money. However, payments from the second scheme will be made on a pro rata basis, which will better reflect the individual circumstances of and actual costs incurred by each driver. Payments will be calculated on the basis of the actual number of days a driver can provide evidence of full insurance, and that is £250 would be paid for every 30 days of full insurance, up to a maximum of £3,000 for 360 days. So in practice, what this means is that a driver, uh, assuming he or she had fully met the criteria and been paid £1,500 during the current scheme, would be eligible for the maximum support of up to £3,000 for the total 12-month scheme. Uh, and for those who didn't have continuous insurance and thereby weren't eligible for the first scheme, they will now receive payment on a pro rata basis. I think that's important in terms of implementing learning and getting help, Mr Deputy Speaker, to those taxi drivers who weren't able to avail of our first scheme. Ms. Michelle McElveen. Speaker, and I, and I thank the Minister for her responses to date. And I welcome the Minister's announcement that a new scheme will open for private bus and coach operators. Will the Minister give an assurance that this will not just be an extension of the previous scheme, given the issues that have been associated with that? And will she also commit to a similar scheme for taxi operators, mindful that the Finance Minister has money to spend? Thank the member for her question. Uh, in fact, I met with the representatives of the private bus, bus and coach operators again yesterday evening uh, to gain their views on what they felt worked with the first scheme uh, and where they felt there were flaws. And so we've committed to working with them uh, as we devise the second scheme. And I've committed my officials to a follow-up meeting with them to talk about some of the more technical issues we discussed uh, yesterday evening. In respect of the taxi operators, I can confirm that they are eligible for the Department for 
poorer communities, Part B, uh, Coronavirus Restrictions Business Support Scheme. Uh, taxi operators are eligible to apply, and Mr Deputy Speaker, their payments will be paid retrospectively to the point at which their business was impacted by restrictions. And this has been confirmed to me in correspondence from the Minister for Economy. Mrs Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, I know you're aware that the members of the committee have raised the issue of the second scheme being issued on a pro rata basis uh, because many of these taxi drivers who temporarily suspended their insurance did so because they were shielding or they simply had no money to work. So therefore, given that the picking up what the chair has said about the finance minister asking ministerial colleagues to come forward with further bids, are you anticipating or even organising or arranging to bring forward an additional bid for an enhanced scheme? I'm conscious the second scheme is coming out, but the taxi drivers do not feel that the £3,000 over a year is sufficient for them. I thank the member for her question. Um, the scheme was devised with those in the sector. Um, they actually, and I think this is on the public record, had requested a payment of £6,000 over a two-year period. Uh, the schemes that I'm bringing forward will give £3,000 for a one-year period, uh, thereby meeting that threshold. In respect of the drivers who uh, are shielding, um, you will be aware that this scheme is one that is based on contribution to cost. It is in addition to the self-employed scheme, and it is also in addition to the Department for Communities Discretionary Support Grant Scheme, which the Department for Communities specifically set up to help all of those who are shielding. I am more than happy to make further representations to the Minister for Communities to see if we can provide additional financial support to all of those who have had to shield through this very difficult time. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Uh, given, Minister, that you have acted quite quickly and ensured help to drivers, and now further assistance will be provided, what discussions have you had uh, with the Economy Minister regarding the DFE support for taxi drivers and operators? Thank the member for his question. Um, I continue to press for the inclusion of the taxi sector in the Department for Economy-led schemes, especially given that the sector is being further impacted by the current restrictions. I remain fundamentally of the view that the executive needs to take an inclusive and fair approach to the financial support provided for restrictions through the DFE CBRSS scheme, and that all businesses that are eligible to apply should be able to do so. As a member may be aware, the Department for Economy CRBSS scheme was introduced to support businesses that have been affected by the restrictions in place as a result of the health protection regulations. In addition to being able to avail of previous business support grants or loan schemes, taxi operators can also apply for the Part B scheme, uh, provided other eligibility criteria are met. Any successful applications, as I said, uh, made to this scheme will be backdated to the period in which restrictions apply to them. I remain fundamentally of the view, as I say, though, that the scheme should be more inclusive, and so I will continue to make representations uh, to try to ensure the taxi drivers as well as private bus, bus and uh, coach operators are included alongside the taxi operators in this scheme. Ms. Rachel Woods. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for answers so far. But does the Minister have any information on when the new scheme for taxi drivers will be launched and how will this be communicated to taxi drivers? So we would hope to um, uh, launch this new scheme by the middle of this month in February. Uh, and as I said in a previous response, I, also, I always think that it is right and proper that we as ministers reflect on our schemes uh, and the learning from that. Um, I accept that it was frustrating for applicants um, because they didn't have a dedicated telephone line, for example, to be able to ring up and to get an update on their application. Uh, at the time, during the first scheme, uh, all dedicated resources were focused on processing the thousands of applications received as a matter of priority, and applicants were advised to send queries uh, to a dedicated email uh, address. But this time round, I am focused and I've made it clear that I want to see us doing better. Um, and so while not all of the COVID-related support schemes have provided a dedicated phone contact, I have asked my officials to provide a telephone contact for the next taxi driver financial assistance scheme uh, so that we can get information quickly to all applicants. We have had the question and five supplementaries. I appreciate that other members were wanting in on this, but I think we, we need to move on. Dr. Kiva Archibald. 
I thank the member for her question. Uh, tackling the climate emergency is a global challenge we all face, and as Infrastructure Minister, I have made addressing climate change one of my key priorities. My officials have been working closely with the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles on the development of transport decarbonisation plans and are leading on the transport elements of the Department for the Economy's proposed new energy strategy. This work focuses on four main themes modal shift, including active travel options, the electrification of transport, alternative fuels capa capability, and the future of mobility, which looks at IT solutions such as mobility as a service and micro mobility options, such as the use of electric bikes and e cargo bikes for short journeys and last mile delivery. Consideration is also being given to how alternative fuels can be deployed across the transport sector, including the use of compressed natural gas, liquid natural gas for freight, the electrification of transport, including opportunities for greening the public sector fleet, and how green hydrogen can be used to power heavier vehicles other than buses, exploring the potential for use in refuge collection and in the marine and retail sectors. To support improvements in the commercial provision of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, I have been able to support the EU Interreg funded Faster Electric Vehicle Network project. And this is a joint proposal across Scotland, the South um, and the North, and aims to install a total of 73 new EV rapid charging points across the island of Ireland and the west of Scotland by the 31st of March 2023. I have also made changes to the planning system through permitted development rights to make it easier to expand the existing charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. And my officials are working with the Electricity Supply Board to assist with their plans to replace 70 charge points across the north to help improve reliability. Three new hydrogen buses entered into service on our public transport network in December 2020, and these will be followed by 100 zero emission vehicles over the next two years, including 80 battery electric buses and 20 hydrogen fuel cell buses. Dr. Archibald. Um, I thank the Minister for her very comprehensive response, and obviously, it is um, a multifaceted approach that is required. Um, encouraging people into public transport is going to be critical to this also, and just in respect of that, obviously, park and rides are, are one way of. Um, of encouraging people to use public transport and to make it accessible. Um, from a constituency perspective, when the A6 scheme was announced, three park and rides were planned at Drumahoe, Claudy and Dungiven. The Drumahoe one has progressed, and I have engaged extensively with both TransLink and DFI around the Dungiven one. Frustratingly, there has been a back and forth around location, and we have been told for some time a decision is imminent. So could I just ask the Minister for an update in relation to the park and rides on the A6? Good. I thank the member for her question. And the utilisation of parks and rides uh, is extremely high and continues to grow, illustrating how it can play a vital role to support the move to more sustainable modes of travel and reduce congestion and air pollution. In the last seven years, my department has delivered around 3,400 park and ride additional spaces at a cost of approximately £16.5 million, which has encouraged a modal shift. And I do uh, continue. I am focused on progressing further park uh, and ride provision as a sustainable transport measure. The member has written to me in respect of the Dungiven park and ride, uh, and work is ongoing in terms of potential sites and feasibility. But I recognise the importance of this, and I have asked for work to be completed at pace so that I can then make a decision on the next steps. Mr. Andrew Muir. Well, Deputy Speaker, as the Minister will be aware, last year we passed legislation to legalise e-bikes used on the public highway. Um, has any consideration been given by the Minister to launching an e-bike public car scheme? I'm thinking of particular towns and cities across Northern Ireland where getting up hills is much more of a struggle. I'm thinking of Shipkey Street, for example, in Derry, and an e-bike public car scheme would be very popular in areas like that. Thank the member um, for his question. Um, and Mr. Catney is an avid user of the electric uh, bikes, and so will be able to provide testimony the ease with which he can go up very steep hills. Um, in respect um, of a public hire scheme, it is something that I would be willing to consider as part of the Blue Green Fund and the work of the Walking and Cycling Champion. We have been engaging with councils, and I have been making it clear that I would like to see us working much more closely and supporting councils in the rollout of their bike schemes. Certainly, I would be up for considering whether we could also look at e-bikes as part of that wider scheme. Those steep hills in Lisburn must represent a unique challenge. Uh, Justin McNulty. 
Gurma Yogurt's last count caller, Minister, I want to applaud you on your strong and composed leadership and delivery on projects like Casement Park, A6, A1, support packages for, tra- for tra- taxis and bus operators, all projects that Sinn Féin failed to deliver on when they, were, when they had the ministry. If they spent less time standing beside potholes getting pictures taken in to make it more done, I'm sure, is, I'm sure, order, order members, I'm sure, Mr McNulty, the question is just struggling to get out. <laughs> On the tip of my tongue, on the tip of my tongue, if Sinn Féin members spent less time taking, getting their pictures taken beside potholes to attack you with, then they might get more done. Minister, what discussions have you had with both the Irish and British governments about tackling our carbon footprint across these islands? The member will be aware that we have already worked together uh, to secure in partnership uh, with the EU funding under the FASTER programme to deliver more e-charging points across this island. Um, I met again uh, just this week with Minister Ryan and we continue to work together on more sustainable all-island infrastructure, including looking at greener and cleaner options such as rail and investment in greenways. I also will be meeting, as I have said, with my Scottish and Welsh counterparts again later this week to discuss how we can work together to aid the green recovery. I have also, on a number of occasions, raised the need for investment in infrastructure with the British Government to help deliver cleaner, greener, more sustainable ways of travel. And my officials continue to work closely with the Office for Low Emission Vehicles on the development of transport decarbonisation plans and with the Department for the Economy on the transport elements of the proposed new energy strategy for the North. This work is intended to address strategic energy issues, including the requirement to respond to climate change and to work to deliver on our net zero carbon targets. The climate crisis does not respect borders, and the climate crisis will only be effectively tackled if we work together at both a local and a global level. Mr Robbie Butler. No. Okay. Move on to the next question, then. Mr Melissa McHugh. A uh, question for Ira. Thank the member for his question. The member will know of my commitment to tackling regional imbalance, connecting communities and improving road safety. And the A5 project very much aligns with this commitment. The project has been subject to three separate legal challenges since its inception in 2007. The most recent being in December 2017, when a new decision to proceed with a scheme made in the absence of a minister was challenged, leading to the quashing of the statutory orders in November 2018. Since then, my department has been actively progressing the necessary work to enable a fresh decision to be made. In spring 2019, an addendum to the environmental statement of 2016, together with other environmental reports, were published for consultation. Following the public inquiry held during February and March of 2020, My department received an interim report from the inspector in the latter part of last year. My officials have considered the issues raised and recommendations made in this interim report and have taken legal advice. I have been actively considering the advice from officials and the legal advice and hope to be in a position to make an announcement on the next steps for this flagship project in the coming weeks. I can assure the member of my continued commitment to this scheme. Mr McHugh. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, and you know, uh, as we all do, just uh, how vital uh, the development of the A5 is, not only for the safety of those who travel on it, uh, but for the development of the North West region and itself, both economically and socially. And given that funds are now uh, available, uh, what are we likely to see, we'll say, uh, they say foots on the ground or the spades on the, on the road, rather, uh, this work commencing? I know that the member has made a number of representations, certainly since at least I took up offices as well, on the importance. And he is right, the scheme is important for road safety reasons, but it is also a strategic economic corridor, and it is also a, a commitment in New Decade new approach uh, as well. On the issue of timeframes, um, as soon as I make a decision, uh, that will then define the timeframe for next steps, but I am making it clear that I am committed to this project and I want to see it progress um, at pace. In respect of the issue uh, of funding, I welcome the fact that the Irish Government has reaffirmed its £75 million commitment to the project and also the fact that the Taoiseach has announced the Shared Island Fund uh, as well. So I will be continuing to make representations to executive colleagues, to the British Government, to honour their NDNA commitments and, of course, to the Irish Government as well, because we have a number of north-south infrastructure projects that will bring huge economic, social and environmental benefits to all of our citizens. Mr Robbie Butler. 
to Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. And in her answer, she did refer to her, her absolute uh, commitment to improving road safety. The Minister will know that the A1, and there was an announcement earlier this week on the A1, is a seriously dangerous road. I've lost friends and former colleagues to road accidents, sir. I've attended many tragic incidents. So would the Minister like to update us on the improvements that are uh, coming to the A1 and maybe a time frame? I thank the member for his question and I offer him my sympathies on the loss of his, of his friends and colleagues. Um, it is tragic that this road has seen so many fatalities and accidents and also is sadly a very frequent location for the fire service which the member uh, was a former employee of. Um, on Thursday, the 20th of January, I announced my decision to proceed with the A1 Junctions Phase 2 Road Improvement Scheme and release the inspector's report. And I was delighted to announce this key step in the development of this significant scheme because it will address safety issues along a 25-kilometre stretch of the A1 between Hillsborough and Lockbrook Land. I am very aware of how important the A1 improvements are for the many people who have expressed their support for the scheme, especially to all those who have lost loved ones. That announcement was a milestone for this project, Mr Deputy Speaker, but it was a milestone that belonged to all of those families who have campaigned on this issue for so long. As I said to them, and I reiterate again in this House, I will do all that I can to expedite this vitally important scheme. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for reaffirming her commitment to this vital A5 project. Uh, there is a, a united front in relation to delivering this project. The Minister will, I hope, agree with me the most damaging uh, 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 interference to this project has been the alternative A5 alliance who have derailed this project time and time again with legal battles working against the majority of people who want this road delivered. Will the Minister join me in calling with representatives across this House to stand with you, Minister, to see this vital roads project delivered and developed immediately uh, as a matter of urgency to save lives and to uh, improve the economic prospects across this island? I thank the member for his question. And I do agree, um, as politicians, it can be very difficult to resist the temptation of playing party politics with any issue. Uh, the A5 is certainly an issue that unites representatives from across all political parties uh, and from all different backgrounds who live uh, in the vicinity and use it and who have lost loved ones on it. So I would ask that we continue to stand together and work together to ensure that we do deliver on this crucial uh, infrastructure project at the earliest opportunity. Ms Paula Bradshaw. Speaker, um, I would certainly echo the comments from the previous speaker there around the expectation and anticipation of this road being delivered. But, Minister, are you confident that the money that has been allocated for the next financial year will be spent and that um, some of it won't be handed back? Thank you. As a Minister for Infrastructure, I never set out with the intention to hand money back. In fact, in this uh, financial year, uh, the return from my department, I believe, is 0.27% uh, of its budget. Uh, that is uh, an achievement that I want to place on record my appreciation to staff for, because we were operating under very difficult circumstances given COVID and the impact that that has on construction works in terms of mitigations to ensure that workers are kept safe. So I want to assure the member that at every opportunity I will bid for money and at every opportunity I will ensure that we spend it in a way that delivers maximum benefit for our citizens. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank the member for his question. I understand the pressures that have faced road hauliers throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Northern Ireland needs haulage drivers and all other logistics uh, professionals to keep supply chains moving. To ensure the continuing flow of goods into and out of Northern Ireland, I put in place last year a range of regulatory measures, including the suspension of all MOT tests for commercial vehicles and relaxations of other requirements. I also considered the evidence provided by the sector of the financial pressures faced by haulage operators because of the impact of COVID-19 and recognised that some sectors have been impacted more than others. However, the exceptional circumstances threshold required by the Financial Assistance Northern Ireland Act 2009 has not been met. I, however, continue to keep financial support for the industry as a result of COVID-19 under review. I appreciate that hauliers have faced additional impacts arising from Brexit in January. However, these difficulties and financial costs relate in the main to trade and customs matters, many of which need to be resolved by the British government working with other executive departments. Everyone working in the haulage industry has rallied to take on the challenges of COVID-19 
and I am personally thankful for everything they are doing to keep supply chains moving in these difficult times. I am afraid we will only have time for one supplementary. Mr Buckley. Thank you, uh, Mr De Deputy Speaker. The Minister will know that road hauliers face a deeply uncertain time on two fronts. Firstly, with COVID-19, with isolation costs and indeed uh, retail sectors cr closed uh, across uh, GB mainland, meaning no backlog loads coming back to Northern Ireland and additional cost. In addition to that, we have the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was supported by your party in this House for the rigorous implementation of meaning access costs and access bureaucracy for those road haulers. Question. Can the Minister uh, outline concrete proposals that she can put forward to the Minister of Finance for additional resource to help these hauliers in this difficult time? I can assure the member that I have worked extremely closely with DERA. I have worked extremely closely with the Department uh, for Transport. We have worked extremely closely with the Road Haulage Association and Logistics UK to understand the up-to-date picture for road hauliers at a local and UK-wide level. As I say, I keep the situation under close examination, and the most recent logistics performance tracker report from December 2020 provided by Logistics UK shows that only 1.2% of HGVs are parked up and that only 1% of drivers are currently furloughed. I agree wholeheartedly with the member that hauliers are being impacted by Brexit, and that's why I will continue to work with all of my executive colleagues and our representations to the British Government and to others to ensure that we can get the easements that are required, that we can work with the industry um, as, a, as a cohesive executive. We now move on to topical questions. Uh, question number three, standing in the name of Mr Mervyn's story, has been withdrawn, and I'm sure all members would join with me in wishing Mervyn a quick recovery. He's presently in isolation because of um, coronavirus. Um, so the first person on my list is Ms Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to ask for an update um, on the Minister's review of the planning application process to ensure planners have all the appropriate guidance on ammonia and are led by the science and data to help mitigate emissions. I thank the member for her question. I fully appreciate the concern about the scale and complexity of the ammonia problem in Northern Ireland and the need to protect human um, health and our natural environment. This is an issue of regional significance and presents a significant challenge to planning authorities in determining applications for ammonia emitting development proposals. DERA, as a statutory nature conservation body, has policy responsibility in relation to ammonia nitrate's impact on the environment and acts as a statutory consultee to the planning system. Its statutory consultation input is informed by an operational protocol relating to ammonia and nitrate's uh, deposition. DERA accepts its protocol needs to be revised. Uh, the member may remember from a recent assembly debate on ammonia that I had written to the Minister for, Ag or for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, who advised that the work on the ammonia strategy, including a review of its operational protocol, is in its final stages of preparation prior to public consultation. While this has led to delays in determining a number of applications for agricultural development, I would hope that future DERA advice, based on an up-to-date scientific data and consistent with recent case law, will see councils in a position where they have confidence to make such determinations. Ms Woods. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for answers so far. Another aspect that was brought up at that recent debate was shared environmental services. Could the Minister outline the rationale for refusing requests from shared environmental services for the additional funding to carry out the habitats regulations assessments? I thank the member for her question. Um, there was a request for additional funding that was being examined, yes, by my department, but also for the Department uh, for Communities, as I understand it. I think the issue of increased financial support is one that would have to be pictured in the round. Uh, a number of councils have seen uh, an increase in income, for example, uh, as well as outgoing costs. And so if any work were to be taken forward in that, it would need to look at all of the factors. It's something that I will look at. Um, but as far as I'm aware, the Department for Communities ha has replied to say that they wouldn't be in a position to, to increase funding at this time. Mr Paul Given. Deputy Speaker, the uh, backlog in people wanting to do their driving tests has been well documented. Thousands of people being denied that opportunity, uh, particularly impactive on young people uh, and, and those seeking uh, job opportunities where this is a requirement. Uh, what is the current position in terms of the backlog and what actions is the Minister taking to address them? 
I thank the member for his question. Uh, the DVA resumed driving tests for private cars from the 1st of September, prioritising tests for key workers and those who had their tests cancelled between March and June 2020. The DVA opened its uh, driving test booking system for all customers on the 5th of October, but since then this service has been significantly disrupted due to further COVID restrictions introduced by the executive. Following the announcement of the executive's post-Christmas restrictions, driving tests have ceased from the 28th of December to the 5th of March. To help mitigate the impact on customers who are waiting patiently to take their driving tests, I brought forward legislation to extend the validity of theory test pass certificates. When driving tests resume again, the DVA is planning to reopen the booking service in phases based on the expiry dates of theory test pass certificates to give priority to those who have been waiting the longest time. The DVA continues to increase its capacity by recruiting additional examiners and will be offering appointments on Saturdays and in the evenings as we move into spring and the brighter nights. The DVA will also use overtime to rota off shift dual role driving examiners to provide further capacity. Mr. Given. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Well, I look forward to the Minister championing the cause of those that have been denied the opportunity uh, to sit their driving tests and dealing with what is now a quite unacceptable backlog and uh, the deprivation that that leads to those that can't get it. Vitally important, of course, is the ability to uh, drive on decent roads. The Finance Minister previously, uh, a number of weeks ago, indicated that he hadn't received a bid or there wasn't funding for the road service maintenance, which annually and historically would have been a significant recipient for end-of-year financial monies. Is there a reason why there hasn't been that kind of uh, bid from your department? If I could first of all address the first point, um, Mr Given, I did not stop driving tests. The executive of which your party is a member took the decision to stop driving tests because there are close yeah. contact services okay. to keep citizens safe. Ever since, my department and the DVA have had plans in place to reinstate driving tests as soon as those restrictions end, but as the executive has rolled on those restrictions, we have adapted accordingly. We have published our plans. I take this situation very seriously, and we continue to do all we can to fully reinstate services in a safe way as soon as possible. In respect of the issue of finance, I set aside £75 million for the Structural Maintenance Fund, which was the same as last year. I set aside £12 million for a road recovery fund, £10 million of which was for rural roads because I am very much committed to tackling regional imbalance. I have bid throughout this financial year for additional monies for structural maintenance. And in fact, we have seen an 11 per cent increase in the money being allocated because, again, I take this issue seriously because I recognise it is important to residents right across Northern Ireland. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, um, having seen the draft budget, I am sure that you will agree with me that there are concerns about the level of funding that your department is receiving, and particularly in reflection of the money that will be going for Northern Ireland Water. Um, we know that the Minister for Communities has put forward an ambitious proposal for housing. Um, could you confirm to this House what talks there have been between you um, to ensure that where the investment for Northern Ireland Water is going will actually help another department to achieve their, their housing targets? I thank the member for her question. Um, and she raises a very important issue. Uh, members will be aware, aware that £2 billion is required um, in terms of investment in our water and wastewater infrastructure for the next price control period. That reflects capital requirement uh, as well as a resource requirement. And members will be aware of the draft budget uh, and the resource budget uh, currently being proposed to be allocated to my department, uh, which is a cut. Um, but I recognise absolutely the importance of building many more new social uh, and affordable homes. And I have supported the communities ministers and her representations on this issue in the executive. But the truth is, there are 116 locations across Northern Ireland now that are either at or beyond their developmental capacity. So if we do not invest in our water and wastewater infrastructure, we will not be able to build the many social and affordable homes we, we, we need. We will not be able to stimulate our economy. We will not be able to create the employment that our citizens need. We will not be able to tackle the climate emergency. And in fact, we will not be able to achieve the objectives that we have all signed up to in the programme for government. Ms Armstrong. 
Thank you very much, and I concur with the minister. Um, indeed, in the Strangford constituency, we have had other uh, we've had areas that have ground to a halt as far as building is concerned because there wasn't capacity in wastewater treatment. Um, I'm very aware that there are um, across our councils issues with planning departments and delays that are happening. I was just wondering how much work is being done between the department and those councils to identify where there are issues with uh, Northern Ireland water and wastewater treatment works, so that we don't keep on building on this delay in planning. Thank the member for a question. Um, and the member may know that Northern Ireland Water has been engaging in an extensive consultation and information exercise with all of the councils um, to make them aware of the challenges within their own areas. And this is particularly important as councils develop their local uh, development plans. Uh, all councils uh, in developing their local development plans recognise the importance of ensuring that they provide housing for their citizens and they also recognise the economic multiplier that is derived from that, particularly for the construction industry. So Northern Ireland Water will continue to engage in this front. My department is also working closely with the councils as they develop their local development plans. And I would also uh, encourage members in your engagement with your own elected representatives and your communities to be raising awareness of this issue. Um, the Minister for Health, the Minister for Education, understandably can point very emotively to the challenges that their department is trying to deal with. Uh, when you're able to turn on your tap, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, you get water. You, when you get charred, you get water. Uh, you don't realise how much of a challenge it is. So I would look to members as well to help me and to help Northern Ireland Water in raising the importance of this issue. Mr Alan Chambers. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, could the Minister give me an update on the progress of the innovative pilot project at Kinniger Wastewater Treatment Works in Hollywood, designed to separate the oxygen and hydrogen in water? I thank the member for his question, and uh, I assume he's referring to the Part X project, which is a collaborative piece between the Department for Economy uh, and Northern Ireland Water. Uh, as he says, this is an innovative uh, project. It's about seeing can we drive forward the opportunities and the potential within our economy. Uh, for hydrogen, uh, but it also will, if it proves to work, and I have no doubt that it will, will be able to deliver efficiencies for Northern Ireland Water as well. So there are multiple benefits to be um, had from this. So work and that continues, but I'm happy to provide in writing uh, the very latest update on that project for the member. Mr Chambers. Thank you, Minister, for that. Uh, Minister, could the use of the separated oxygen in the sewage treatment process help alleviate in any way the noxious smells that have emanated from this plant on occasions over recent years? Uh, as I said to, uh, to the member, there are multiple benefits to be had uh, from this project, uh, from its working through to, to its completion. Uh, one is around efficiencies, but I have no doubt that one of them will be the issue of, of um, smell that the member has referred to. But I will make sure that when we are providing you with the written update that we also address that issue. Mr Thomas Buchanan. Deputy Speaker. Minister, during earlier questions, I noted you took a number of questions in relation to support schemes for taxi drivers and coach operators. However, what I didn't hear was what you have done uh, to provide for those who own and operate wedding vehicles who also suffered substantial losses over the COVID period. So can you give us some indication as to what is available for them? I thank the member for uh, his question. And I have engaged with representatives of the wedding car industry. Uh, I am aware that a number have been able to avail of support schemes to date uh, through the Department for Economy. Individual drivers as well within the industry will, always, will also have been eligible for the taxi driver financial assistance scheme that I have brought forward. Mr. McKenna. Yeah, individual drivers may well be uh, available or may well be able to tap into that. But for the people who own the number of vehicles, for example, uh, th there's somebody in my constituency and they own six or eight of these vehicles. There seems to be no support for them whatsoever. So therefore, you know, I'm just wondering why, as Minister, you haven't thought in bringing forward some type of a scheme to help and assist these people who are also suffering a substantial losses as a result of the COVID-19, and we also see that the, the, minister, the finance minister is quite a, a bit of money looking to be spent. Do you not think it's time you, you looked about bringing forward a scheme specifically for these particular people? I thank the member for his question. I think we need to establish first the facts, and we need to be very clear on 
what the taxi or what the wedding car industry um, representatives and members have been able to avail of. Uh, it is my understanding that they have been able to avail of a number of the schemes uh, at a uh, UK government level, but also uh, at an executive level as well. Uh, while I'm not responsible for administering the Department for Economy Part B scheme, uh, I have had it confirmed in writing that taxi operators are eligible. It would seem to me to be fair and only right that wedding car, uh, the wedding car industry, who are also being impacted by the current restrictions would also be eligible for that scheme. I am happy to write to the Minister for Economy to um, establish if that is the case and share that correspondence with the member. Mr. Morris Bradley. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, a few years ago I had asked the Department about a resident parking scheme for Port Rush. At that time I was informed a pilot scheme was soon to be rolled out in South Belfast. But once the findings were known, that initial pilot scheme would be then possibly rolled out across Northern Ireland and would include, include Port Rush. I know this was not under your tenure, Minister, but could I ask what was the outcome of that pilot scheme? Was it a success? And if so, could such a scheme now be rolled out to the benefit of the people who live in Port Rush and other areas of Northern Ireland? The member um, for his question, and he is right. There was a piece of evaluation work being carried out uh, on the back of that pilot scheme. Um, I'm awaiting a submission detailing uh, that evaluation and that analysis. It isn't within my receipt uh, as yet, but I'm hoping to receive it shortly. And I've already gave a commitment in this House that I will publish that report because I'm very uh, cognizant of the fact that members have a real interest in this issue, and certainly residents across Northern Ireland. Have have a keen interest in this issue, given the difficulties with uh, parking in their areas. Mr. Bradley, very briefly. I will be brief, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, there is a, a grave concern that people who live can't get parked outside their houses because they've got health problems or because they have carer teams that are required to visit. And I would ask the minister to look at it urgently. Thank you. And uh, that is a very important point. And the point that I, I would make in addition uh, to my previous answer is that if you do have constituents who have mobility and disability um, issues, I would encourage them to apply to the Department for Infrastructure uh, to be included in the Blue Badge scheme. While that does not address the overriding problem, it may bring some easement uh, and comfort to some of your constituents who find themselves in this difficult situation. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. The next item on the agenda is an urgent question to the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Mr Gordon Lyons. If I could ask members just to take their ease for a few moments until there is a change at the top table. And don't forget, if you are leaving the chamber, to wipe down the surface where you were. Thank you.